Crikey. Oh, and spoilers. Welcome to the channel, I'm Hayes, I talk movies all day, so subscribe right now if you want to be entertained and today I want to talk about Thor Love and Thunder, the fourth Thor film. So how this works is I'm going to go through the movie, point out all the reasons I can find as to why it's trash and then in the end, drop a few final Thor thoughts. So the movie starts off pretty sad actually. Gore is carrying his daughter through deserted wasteland while praying to Rapu for water for his child, but she dies anyway. Like, damn, did Marvel hire DC writers for this? Also, how is his name Gore, but the daughter is called Love? I mean, I guess it's not impossible, but shouldn't her name be like, Ogangela or something? Anyway, Gore hears the voice of the Necro Sword calling him. He follows it and finds Rapu living in abundance while his followers suffered and starved and died until Gore was the last one left, and Rapu still don't want to help. So Gore ends up killing Rapu with the Necro Sword, and I ain't mad at it. This guy stayed faithful to Rapu through famine, through drought, through everyone around him including his own daughter dying, just to find out the god he devotes his life to don't care about him at all. Now something like that? Man, that's enough to make a Christian bell. For real though, I really do like the opening scene, but here's the thing, when Rapu vanquished the previous hold of the Necro Sword, why didn't he destroy the sword? Or at least put it somewhere no one can find it? This guy just left it there next to the fresh body and started celebrating when they ain't even finished yet? Are you dumb? Furthermore, who's the we that vanquished the Necro Sword holder? Cause those flower looking people ain't fighting nobody. So where are the other warriors? They just left Rapu and his Jack Jones to eat fruit next to a dead body and a god killing sword with no backup? I mean if you were gonna leave anyway then don't you think you should have taken a sword with you? They did not think this through. Or oh, when Rapu says we, maybe he meant the grand we, referring to just himself. And if that's the case, then if he's so gangster he can vanquish a necro sword wielding warrior on his ones, then how come he can't pull up a fight against a malnutritioned, misguided fool that literally just turned up? The math ain't math in here. So this is my vow. Oh God, she will die. So basically, God of War 3. Actually, Gore does kind of look like a skinny Kratos. Now I ain't know about you, but the 80s rock version of the Marvel comic flip intro kind of felt like an odd segue after that opening scene. Like it just turned into a John Hughes movie all of a sudden. Anyway, now we got a Korg voiceover catching us up on what we need to know and did he just compare Thor breaking up with Jane to Thor watching his friends and family die and home getting destroyed? Nah, they are not the same thing bro. But here's the thing, Thor is over 1500 years old and according to Korg he has loved many a female creature. So why is Jane his one true love? First of all, as Guardian lifespan to human lifespan, that's a relationship that could never work and B, being with Jane for Thor is really gonna be like babysitting an infant. I mean how much more experience is he gonna have in life and the universe and realms compared to some 30 something year old earth scientist? So either Thor is extremely mentally underdeveloped or somebody might want to call Chris Hansen. See you down there. To be fair, he was raised by a woman who was raised by witches, so yeah, that kind of makes sense. Anyway, I get that this scene is supposed to be funny, you know, it's done with a light-hearted, humorous flair, but can't lie, this is not working for me. It just feels out of place and unnecessary, like trying to recapture past glory, but it turns out it just wasn't enough water in the well, so now you're just dragging out dirt and 200-year-old zombie bones or something. Watch those movies. Okay. Okay. Saw the hot cheetos. Had to get it. Ah oh, yes, Darcy is back. Finally! You know, if they're gonna go with this serious slash comedy style movie, you definitely want Darcy, cause from the jump she had a natural humor. And she was definitely missed in Ragnarok, so I'm looking forward to seeing what she can bring throughout all of this movie. Anyway, Jane's got cancer and they don't say this but I'm assuming that's from Thor 2 when she had the ether, cause that's the shit that make his soul burn slow. So we get introduced to new Asgard, but Asgard isn't a place, so what's new about it? If anything, they should have called it Half Scarred, cause you know, half of them are dead. 
Also, did they really just turn up in a town in Norway and settle there? At this point, they've only been there for around 6 or 7 years. Bear in mind, King Thor was a drunk gamer bum until Valkyrie took over for the last 1 or 2 years. And in that time, they already got tourism and sponsorship deals? I mean, big up King Valkyrie all day every day, but if Norwegians start complaining that foreigners are taking their jobs, I ain't mad at it. So, since only the worthy can move Mjir Mjir, I guess they had to dig around the broken pieces and take the whole bit of land, right? But when Hela broke Mjir Mjir, the broken pieces were a lot bigger, so somebody moved something. So who neutered Star-Lord? Last time we saw Thor and the Guardians together was a couple of years ago in Endgame, where Thor and Star-Lord had this almost standoffish, dick measuring ego contest type relationship. Now it seems Star-Lord is just kissing Thor's ass. Why? I mean, I know a lot can change in two years, but Thor's attitude doesn't seem to have changed at all. So what happened to make Star-Lord start asking permission to speak to his own subordinate? Because maybe they should be telling that story instead. Also, it's only been a few minutes and those giant screaming goats already feel like the worst idea Marvel ever had. You know, I was thinking that it's pretty disrespectful for Astrid to have a Mad Titans poster, considering his dad was killed by the Mad Titan Thanos. But then it occurred to me, Heimdall was very dedicated to his job as the Watcher. Plus, this is the first time we even see he had a son. Heimdall was a shit dad, spent all that time watching everything but his own damn kid. You know, if Thor had time to chat with Valkyrie and stare at Jane while Korg narrates the backstory, then these bad guys are not a threat. Also, this whole interaction feels off. Gors already killed a bunch of gods, injured Sif and is now attacking new Asgard. So why is Thor talk to him like he's some one episode Buffy the Vampire Slayer villain? Kind of an oversimplification to say that I left. You did. You wrote me a beautiful handwritten letter. You weren't there I was. actually, hence the note. This is easy. Jane left. The fact that Jane wrote the note means that she expected him to come back, but didn't want to speak about their issues in person. Hence, the note. So I can understand how Astrid would be more into 1980s Guns N' Roses than 2020s Guns N' Roses, but what don't make sense is Astrid changing his name to Axel when Slash is right there. But yeah, I think this is supposed to be a message about not dead naming, so let me just call the kid Axel before I get cancelled in 10 years. So it turns out Heimdall never taught Axel how to use his eyes, but Heimdall found time to teach Thor. Heimdall was a shit dad. Well then, if it's colour we need, let's bring the rainbow. I mean, saving lives she's quite good at, but the rest of it she needs work. You know what, I like that catchphrase actually. It's kind of like an 80s only one-liner. These guys are dissing it for no good reason. I mean, what did Thor say? This earns here and now. That's lame, bro. That ain't even a catchphrase. That's just what your mum says when you're in trouble. We can't exactly go in your tiny little flying portal horse, can we? We won't all fit. What are you talking about? War Song's awesome. War Song may be awesome, but the issue was they won't all fit. Levels of awesomeness don't change that fact. Whose idea was it to have Stormbreaker act like a jealous girlfriend? I swear this is like something ChatGPT would have come up with. And whatever happens, never stop fighting. So was that a memory or a dream? Because if it's a dream, I guess it means that little Jane was so devastated by her mother's passing it just felt like she was all alone. But if it's a memory, then why is no one else at the funeral? Did Elaine Foster have no friends or other family and little Jane had to organise and attend her mother's funeral by herself? If so, that would mean Mrs. Foster was no parent. So I ain't no scientific hypothematist or whatever, but I reckon if you hit a sink with a hammer, it won't break like that. That sink broke like it was made out of concrete. I don't know, maybe it was. Anyway, Jane tells Valkyrie to keep the sink thing under wraps, but under wraps from who? Valkyrie is the king. That ship, that whole stolen land they call New Asgard, Valkyrie is the HBIC. So who are you keeping it under wraps from? Thor? Your ex-boy? friend? Come on, really? You know, for a place where the most powerful gods in the universe hang out, the security seems pretty non-existent. These bozos just mashed up the grass on this fancy looking place and nobody said nothing to them? Just gonna let them walk around like it's the thing to do. Their gods have clearly grown arrogant and stopped paying attention, which is why Gore started killing them in the first place. 
Where are we going to hold this year's orgy? Is this guy for real? Honestly, I'm not mad at it. Oh, Valkyrie, I say you are naughty, aren't you? <laughs> but here's the thing, why is Zeus speaking in broken English? Thor just said he's the wisest of all the gods, yet he can't use proper grammar? To be fair, I guess they're going more for comedy with this, but here's the real issue. It's not funny. Seriously, this joke is old. Anyway, Zeus says they're gonna announce the winner of the most human soul sacrificed in the name of a god, but these are gods from all over the universe, so why just human souls? I mean, look, I've seen Star Wars, I know humans aren't just on Earth, but wouldn't this competition be unfair to Nini of the Noni and Bao and any other gods with non-human followers? Also, why is human sacrifices the thing that makes Thor think Zeus isn't all that great? Surely he knew about that, right? After taking so much inspiration from him? So this the first time we've seen nudity in an MCU movie, but let's be clear, it's definitely not the first time we've seen an ass. Anyway, for the wisest of the gods, Zeus is a bit stupid. He told Thor he can't hear him, but was clearly able to hear him. Then he referred to Korg, Valkyrie and Janus as guardians, even though only one of them is. He then said he thought they'd seen the last of the Asgardians when Odin died, so clearly not paying attention there. He mocks Thor because thunder is just the sound of lightning, but he calls his own weapon Thunderbolt bolt, even though it's actually a lightning bolt. And he refers to Thunderbolt as his secret weapon, but secret from who? Everybody knows about it. Dude is parading it in front of the crowd. How is it a secret? And this is the guy in charge? No, I'm definitely with Gore on this one. Anyway, since Thor thinks Zeus is so wise, when Zeus refused to help, why didn't Thor just take the L? I mean, if you think he's so smart, maybe he knows something you don't know. Maybe he's thought about things that you haven't. Because right now, you're acting like a spoiled child throwing a tantrum because one thing didn't go your way. Like, grow up already. You're over 1,500 years old for crying out loud. Come on. So this omnipotent city is where the most powerful gods in the universe hang out. And not only do they let a homeless guy, an unemployed viking, a scientist in cosplay and a giant dude who's afraid of paper just crash land on their lawn, turns out the gods they do have are very easily taken care of. They did not think this through. Oh damn, they killed Korg. Damn, they killed Zeus. Oh, Korg's not dead. All that emotion for nothing, but okay. To be fair, I guess if they brought Korg back from the dead right away, it means every other death in this movie is definitely permanent. There's no way they're gonna bring anyone else back from the dead now. Anyway, Korg didn't die because it turns out the only part of a Cronin that's alive is the mouth. But being a Cronin, wouldn't he already know that? So Korg says he's got two daddies, but in Ragnarok he mentioned his mum and her boyfriend, and apparently this is because Korg was adopted after neither of his dads wanted him no more. But here's the thing, if the only part of a Cronin that's alive is the mouth, then why does holding a hand make a baby? How do you make life by connecting parts of the body that don't have life? They did not think this through. Can they just not? Anyway, it turns out Gorn needs Stormbreaker to open the gates of eternity. But Stormbreaker is only about 7 years old at this point, so surely there were other ways to open the gates of eternity. Maybe a better idea for Gorn to pursue one of those? Also, Thor was holding Stormbreaker, so did he just put it down, then walk away? For why? This whole fight scene is pretty cool though, and the black and white with hints of colour really make it pop that little extra. I wish I could join you, but... I'd probably die and that won't help get the kids back. Wait a minute, wasn't that her plan all along? To die on the battlefield? And now she has a chance to, she decides to sit this one out? How is it that a scientist with stage 4 cancer is more willing to rejoin the fight than a viking warrior? And that whole excuse about if she dies that won't help the kids, that don't make no damn sense at all. If she stays back, Thor is on his own. If she goes, Thor might end up on his own. Now I ain't no fight expert or nothing, but I think a maybe you can help is far more preferable to a definitely you won't. Nah, stick a plaster on that cut, take two Panadol and get back in there Valkyrie, you're better than this. Lead your army to that axe. We shall do our worst. For Asgard. Yeah, this is pretty cool, can't lie. And Guns N' Roses must be getting bare royalties off this. Also, I like the bitter sweetness of Jane showing up, Thor needing her help, but also knowing that they would kill her. But did they really have to go with Eat My Hammer in this moment, right now? They really couldn't think of anything else? 
Really? Anyway, Gore still makes it to Eternity and is about to make his wish, but Thor shouts, Gore, stop! And Gore replies, what kind of father would I be if I stopped? But here's the thing, he did stop, turned all the way around to talk to Thor when he could have just made his wish, right there. Come all this way just to have a chit chat with the guy trying to stop you, when you can just literally wish it all away, right now. So instead of wishing to kill all the gods, Gore wishes to bring his daughter back from the dead, to be raised by the guy he was trying to kill this whole time. Didn't he say his daughter was the lucky one cause she died, why bring her back? Matter of fact, he can wish for anything, right? Why not wish to have unlimited wishes? Then he can wish all the gods dead, his daughter back and good health for himself. Are you dumb? Anyway, the movie ends with Korg narrating. The kids got home safe, Jane got a statue, Korg met a rock and wanted to see his Johnson, and Thor raises Gore's daughter Love. Also, at this point, it becomes clear that Love speaks with an Australian accent, but Gore spoke with a British-ish accent. In fact, Love kinda resembles Thor, so was one of Thor's many female companions Gore's wife? Man, Gore really should've killed them all. There's a mid credit scene that lets us know Zeus is alive cause apparently hardly anyone actually dies in this movie. There's also a post credit scene to let us know that Jane and Heimdall got into Valhalla. But isn't getting into Valhalla contingent on them dying in battle? Both Jane and Heimdall died after their battles. So they just letting anybody in now? You know, don't matter if you're just a human or a shit dad. Apparently anybody can get in. Alright, but whatever, what I really want to know is... Where was Darcy? So what, they just bring her back for one scene then discard her like she hasn't been the best thing about these four movies since day one? Come on now. Alright, so before I get into my final thoughts, if you liked this movie, check out these movies. They're all comedy drama movies as well, but in my opinion, they manage to balance both in a way that feels natural to the film and story they're telling. You know, like somebody actually took time to craft out something that made sense to the world they were building and didn't just throw in every bullshit executive idea. Allegedly. Anyway, let's talk about Thor Love and Thunder. So when Thor came out, I personally thought it was one of the most mediocre MCU movies at the time. It had some charm, but overall I thought it was just meh. Then Thor The Dark World came out and honestly, it was just forgettable. Like really forgettable. I watched it again to prepare for this video and it was almost like watching it for the first time. But then Thor Ragnarok came out and finally they got it right. It was a fresh take on the story and it was so needed. Now I still think they should have found a way to have Darcy in it, but even still they made a great movie. So now Thor Love and Thunder, the fourth Thor film and <sighs> it just feels like a parody of itself. Marvel movies have long been formulaic, but for the most part the formula works. So I'm not sure that's the issue here. The movie is a comedy drama, but it doesn't really blend those genres well. It pretty much goes drama scene, comedy scene, drama scene, comedy scene throughout. But the thing about comedy dramas, or even films that are just straight up comedies, is that they know when to let the tension hang. This movie does not. So many bits end in some shoehorned in joke, and as if that wasn't bad enough, the joke isn't even funny. I mean, I've seen better jokes from YouTubers. Seriously, YouTubers. And in the end, the movie just feels like one great idea that was ruined by one million shitty ideas. But let me talk about what I did like in this film. For me, the biggest standout easily was Gore. From having clear motivations to execution of his plan to just being placed brilliantly by Christian Bell. This was Gore's movie as far as I'm concerned. Now, yeah, they did pretty much bitch him out at the end, but for me, Gore could have been and perhaps should should have been a villain on par with Thanos. This was a guy so consumed with hatred and anger after being betrayed by the god he devoted everything to that he promised to kill all gods just to get talked out of it. And that's really the biggest issue with this film, it's constantly pulling punches. Whether that's ruining a scene with an unfunny joke or bringing back nearly everyone from the dead or just letting you know that they're okay in Valhalla even though they didn't actually meet the requirements, the movie just doesn't commit 
to anything. Speaking of, even Jane Foster getting cancer felt like weak storytelling. And yes, I know Jane gets cancer in the comics too. But as far as the movies go, it just seems like a massive missed opportunity to not have mentioned Jane getting cancer in the dark world after they got the ether out of her. Had they set it up then? By the time we get to Love and Thunder with Mew Mew making her stronger while simultaneously making the cancer worse, and then Jane dying after using Mew Mew one last time to help Thor save the children, that might have hit more than a little bit harder. Anyway, here's the thing, and this is what it would almost always come down to for me. It's never my place to tell creators how to create, and they're under no obligation to make something that I would like. However, objectively speaking, they made a significant change to Star-Lord's character and didn't explain why. They made changes to in-world rules and didn't explain why. And they brought back the best character in a whole Thor series just to discard her after one scene and didn't explain why. Darcy deserves better. But that's what I think of Thor Love and Thunder. What do you think of Thor Love and Thunder? Let me know down below and while you're there be sure to like, subscribe and drop a suggestion if you don't mind.